I feel a lot more comfortable being a Splatoon coach who addresses the aspects of life that can get in the way of playing Splatoon well. Um, like, I legitimately do arrive at a lot of these conclusions, a lot of these things that I talk about, just by, well, here is the problem that's keeping you from being as good at Splatoon as you want to be. <laughs> that's... It's, it's kind of crazy to think about it, but, like, that is actually a way of, you know, improving yourself. Like, if you work at anything, no matter how silly and goofy that thing is, if you have to improve yourself to get there, eventually you're going to come up against some of your own personal demons, and you're going to have to wrestle with those in order to make progress. Um, playing even a video game, a simulation of a simulation... Um, it's something that can help you recognize places where you in your own life would probably falter if you came out under a certain amount of stress. And it, it kind of helps you. That, that's kind of the point of competition. That's something that was a big pillar of, of Bravis's ideology was that competition is for making us better as people so that we can, and I always loved this phrasing, be our best when our best is most needed. So how would you go about managing Tilt as like a team? Like That's a little bit harder uh, because what it really requires is for each individual person to know how they tilt and be trying to manage it individually. Um, it, it's a very emotional thing. Now there are ways that a team can tilt each other and that's something that like it it's really important to try and avoid as much as you possibly can. Um, because like call-outs that come across even as just like not even as mean but just like curt like if you're being a straight shooter if you're uh, telling it like it is sometimes even that can come across and be interpreted as more negative than it actually is intended to be um, that's part of why you hear people making call-outs in that that kind of rising inflection the one on one on snipe one on me Help left, help left. Um, with that rising inflection, it, it never comes across as as negative as you'd think, you know, it might be if it was... One on me! Help left, help left! You know, if you're, if you're really starting to, like, bark at people like that, that can come across the wrong way. Um, another thing that really tends to tilt teams is trying to give criticism in, like, the middle of a match or even the middle of a set. Um, the very most that you ever want to be saying to your team, um, in, by way of, like, trying to improve things, is a non-specific comment, like, Hey guys, remember we were working on trying to call out this situation more, alright? I'm not hearing a lot of calls for that, let's make sure that we're doing that. That's the, the, the most intense that you want any of this criticism to be. Because if it goes any further than that, it starts to sound accusatory. Even if, like, it is one particular person's job to do that thing and you don't even mention them by name, they'll still in 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 internalize that as, oh, they're upset with me. And they, that might start to trigger a pattern of tilt, depending on what's happening. Um, it can be helpful as a team to share what it is that tilts each of them individually. Um, that's getting into, you know, talking about feelings, which is hard. <laughs> and that's <laughs> something that takes a lot of maturity to do. And it takes... a um, one of the things that you need to be able to talk about things like that as a team, which less mature teams are less capable of doing, is the team needs to have an environment where people can be vulnerable with each other. Um, they need to be able to say things that they're, uh, you know, that they don't like about themselves and know that they're not going to be made fun of for that or have that information used against them. Um, and, like, younger people are awful at creating those situations i've been in a classroom and man like you gotta have tough skin thick skin to be in there um and the people who don't just end up withdrawing and not wanting to interact with people at all uh because they don't have that psychological safety they don't have those conditions where people are going to let them be open about their flaws so that they can address them um it takes an extra kind of strength to have that sort of psycho like psychological fortitude i guess in a situation where you haven't created that safety as a team 
Someone has to be especially confident in themselves to be able to come forward with something if they don't feel like the team is going to respond to that in a supportive way. So there's a lot that goes into that. And, you know, maybe I'm going to be able to comment on that a little bit if I do a VOD review for you guys eventually, and I'm going to be able to hear the comms. Um, but it's, it's difficult to... There, there's so many different things that could be happening. Everyone tilts a little bit differently. And so a lot of the time, like, you're going to you're going to have to address that on like a case by case basis on a person by person basis. It's, it's a thing you really have to build a relationship with your teammates to be able to pull off. Um, Cause that's not something you're going to get someone talking about on day one. Yeah. Jules uh, talking about work in a school. This kid made fun of me for moving out of the way to not get hit by a door. They'll clown you for anything. When someone talks about immaturity, they're talking about this sort of thing. They're talking about uh, confidence in oneself, insecurity and, um, insecurity leading you to put other people down to kind of improve your own feelings of security and that leading to them being more insecure and this, this there's this whole awful spiral of this happening um but i think that it's especially worse now because of social media making it easier for people to clown on each other um and making it so that there is a very well-known vernacular for clowning on each other that like twitter is already a place where everyone's takes are short punchy and wrong um and that's really what does numbers on twitter but now you put kids and that social situation into that context and they have adult role models who are being short punchy and wrong so they learn to be short punchy and wrong and that plays into the way they treat each other in the classroom um you, God, it was so frustrating when I would give like what I was trying to make measured criticism when I was trying to be constructive and just try to be helpful and say that, you know, a student had gotten a problem wrong. I would be told that I had roasted that student, uh, you know, Mr. Teacher just roasted you, dude. And I'd look at that kid like I really would rather be roasting you right now, but that's also not going to be helpful because what just happened when you said Mr. Teacher just roasted you was all all your all your crew over there in the corner, your your buddies, your four or five people who will, you know, go off at anything you say, are now jumping up on top of their chairs like, oh freaking out like it's it's like a rap battle or something. And uh now all order has been lost in the classroom. It's it's chaos. This is this is a thing I live through on a daily basis multiple times per class period, you know? It's it's just kind of a generational thing. Um and so it's something that I think is important to talk about for the sake of that generation as they grow up so that they can realize, oh, that thing actually is causing social problems and making it less easy for us to function as teammates. Um it's also really important because with, you know, this being the COVID generation, um, a lot of the in-person communication that would have let people get through these problems is being cut off because group projects are harder to do and you're not seeing the whites of people's eyes. You're not having interactions with people in hallways as often. Like there were, there was some period of time where it was a lot of online school where we're not interacting with people as often. Uh, and those interactions are very specifically structured um, we're not getting as wide of a range of different things that we're having to do together. So, uh, the, there are a lot of concerns that I'm hearing from teachers who are currently in the field that that generation is going to be a little bit behind in terms of, uh, just social understanding that like the maturity that you expect a kid to be at, at age 14, it's taking them until they're age 16 or 17 to get to just because they haven't been in the circumstances that will give them that experience. And like certainly they'll learn those things faster than a 14 year will, 14 year old will because their brains are going to be more developed by then. But um, it is something to, to watch out for in that sort of age range. Um, and like if you're in that age range, like try to use that perspective to think critically about the way that you engage in, in your relationships and, you know, because one other thing I noticed, uh, when I was younger, at first I had a ton of energy and I, I liked talking and I liked people talking to me and class felt kind of fun when class was loud. 
You know, when you just have a lot of energy and you're, you're young like that, things being loud don't bother you as much. But as I got older and older, things being loud started to, like, give me a headache. It started to increase tension. It started to make it, like, wait, I'm starting to recognize that people are trying to say things, and they're not being able to say things because nobody can hear anything because everyone's trying to say something at the same time. And that's not working out. Um, that sort of realization sets in during those kinds of teenage years from about grade 7 to grade 10 or so. Um... And, like, that sort of realization also is probably being delayed. So, th there's a lot of social dynamics there that I think will also apply to Splatoon teams, but that if you learn them from Splatoon, hopefully that will carry over and help you in other aspects of your life as well. Um, that sort of maturity is certainly something that is well appreciated in dating. Um, like, pe people don't like someone who's going to talk over you. They don't like someone who's not going to listen to you. So all of those things are very attractive qualities in a person. And that is also an age at which people are starting to get interested in that. So, hey, there you go. This is also dating advice. You're welcome. Keep the classroom comms clear. Yes, that's why my job is to shush people. <laughs> I, I, I joke a little bit, but not very much about that. Um, the, the way that someone described it to me at one point was when you go into a middle school... Your job is 80% classroom management and 20% actually knowing what you're talking about. 20% um, actually teaching. It's not even knowing what you're talking about. Knowing what you're talking about is like 5% of teaching. Because most of teaching is knowing what they don't know so that you can get the right information to teach them. Because um, it is very easy to overwhelm someone who's struggling. It's very easy to like tell them something that they already know on top of things that they don't know, and they're they're having trouble sorting what it is that they're having a problem with. Um, you've got to be incisive. You've got to get down to what they don't know quickly so that you're not overwhelming them before you try to teach them the thing that they don't understand. Um, so that's a big part of teaching, but then really... There, nothing, no teaching is going to happen if three people in the class are talking over you at once. Um, you know, even if someone's whispering in the very back of the classroom, the problem with that is that if one person is whisper, whispering and somebody sees, oh, hey, Mr. Teacher isn't doing anything about this, this person whispering, even if Mr. Teacher doesn't recognize that there, there's some, someone whispering there, the class might not always realize that the teacher is distracted from what they're looking at and doesn't realize that someone's whispering, and that that person, you know, whispering is is actually just being sneaky with their whispering, the class is all automatically going to assume, oh, they're whispering? That means it's okay to whisper. And so somebody else is going to start whispering. And then somebody else is going to start whispering. And once you have about three people whispering in a classroom, it's much more difficult to tell what's being said because the whispers are distracting, and it takes extra effort to focus. And that's just whispering. If someone's talking immediately a problem even just with the first person who's doing it um so in a class of like 28 people you know you might think oh i don't talk very often in class it's usually just like once or twice throughout the class period well with 28 different people with their one or two times across the class period and you know that there's that one kid who it's not going to be just once or twice that adds up and that's why you know teaching feels so authoritarian sometimes it's just that like we cannot tolerate a, even a very, very small amount of talking. Otherwise, it will actually impact our ability to do our job. And it may seem like really strict, the way that we deal with even just like one person talking one time, but better that's, that it be that strict and maybe we, we get a little bit too far one time every so often than that the classroom is just complete chaos and everyone's getting away with everything. Because that is... It's a very slippery slope. Um, I know slippery slope arguments are a logical fallacy, but it legitimately is something that can build momentum and snowball very quickly if you allow even a little bit of talking. So that's that's why things work the way that they do there. Is chat like having 100 kids always whispering at the back of the classroom? Um, the thing about chat is you don't have to read it. <laughs> you don't have to look at it. You can just like cover up that part of the screen and they're ignorable. Um, and that's one of the cool things about online school that like... You don't actually, you actually can make those kinds of side comments, and it's not 
stopping someone from just not looking at that chat and just looking at what the teacher's saying. The problem with that is that then when people get into an actual classroom, they're used to being able to make those comments, and now it's actually not okay for them to do that. And they, the teachers run into a lot more behavioral problems because they got used to online school, basically. Um... Because, like, I have said all of these things that I've just said and barely been looking at chat at all because I've, I've been, been talking about it. As a teacher, I would have had to pay attention to every single one of those comments, addressing them if they were appropriate and appropriately timed, and silencing them if they were inappropriate. A class of this many people, of having, like, 100 people in chat right now, would be impossible in an in-person setting with children. It's much more possible in college because college kids get it. They're adults at that point, and they're also paying a lot of money to hear the things the professor is telling them. What's this about prom? I missed prom because of online school. They did nothing to make up for it, but... I will say, prom can be awesome under very specific circumstances. <laughs> but for a lot of people, it's just kind of meh, and it can also be awful. <laughs> um, it's a lot of money to spend on something that may or may not be a really good time. Um, I think prom is, <laughs> prom is really fun if you have like a date to go there with. It's really fun if you have a great circle of friends to go there with and like you have people you really wanna spend time there with. Um, if you're going to prom and it's just cause like, eh, I should probably go to prom, like, it's prom, it's only gonna happen once, might as well. That's not a bad reason to go, but it also means that there's probably not a lot there for you, because it's a social gathering. It's something where you, you gotta go there with people you're gonna enjoy being there with. You know, you've gotta go somewhere with people where you're like, oh my gosh, I've never seen you dressed up like this, you look so good. Um, you know, you wanna be hyped about that. You wanna be hyped about being able to spend that time with those people. Because the gathering itself is not going to give you anything that's particularly noteworthy. Um, and if you and your, those friends would have more fun doing something other than, like, a formal dance or something, like, go see a movie or something, right? Like, go just out on the town and have a good time instead. Um, nothing saying that you have to, you know, spend a ton of money on, on what you're wearing and how you're going to get there and the tickets, whatever they may cost, like, if you'd have more fun doing something else. It's all about getting closer with the people you care about um but like if if you if you got like a high school sweetheart and you guys are really cute together and stuff and you're gonna get get to go out there and slow dance and it's gonna be all cute and stuff then yeah that, that's a really fulfilling experience i've seen a lot of people be able to have that experience and it's it's a one-of-a-kind kind of thing it's it's really pretty beautiful so it, it's it's definitely great you know, if you've got that environment, if you've got that social circle and stuff. If you can't think of someone you'd like to go there with, if you can't think of, like, a group of friends that you'd be like, yeah, it'd be really fun if I got to go with those guys. You don't have to go. And it's not a huge deal. Just outdated music choices, people to go there, the fact that you can just go to a normal place and have more fun. Yeah, and if, if those things, you know, are something that bother you, then you don't have to go. Go, go do whatever you're going to have fun doing. Um, but what's, I think, important about those gatherings is that it's a place where you are socially encouraged to just hang out with people. Um, I don't think there, there, there's not enough of that in school, especially with, you know, online school and whatnot. Like, people need to hang out with each other. People need to gain those social skills. Like, I actually discourage people from trying to become valedictorian in their school because the amount of time that that takes means that you're going to have to put off having as many social relationships. And... There are more important things to do than to impress authority figures. There are more important things to do than to get super super high straight-A grades. Um, I knew a guy who was uh, a national cross-country champion. Like, literally the, was the best in the country at high school cross-country. Uh, ended up going on to place pretty highly in the Olympic trials, just barely not making the cut for his event. And... He was quoted often by his teachers as having said, if studying an extra hour is going to mean that... Uh, studying an extra hour past my bedtime is going to mean that I'm going to go from a B-plus to an A-minus on this quiz, then I'm going to get the extra hour of sleep. 
It, it was that kind of thing. And like, granted, a lot of kids are not that well calibrated that they can know, you know, this is this is going to be get me a B plus. You know, a lot of kids they'll say, oh, this is going to get me a B plus, and then they'll go in there and get a D minus. You know, um, so that there there's definitely a little bit of him just being an exemplary student in that regard. That he's just an unusually smart person to be able to say that about himself but the priorities are there i think um there you know cross country was something that was important to him as was his schooling and because he had something that was important besides his schooling he had a reason to go out there and get more experiences he had a reason to interact with other people than just his teachers um that, that was a lot healthier of a thing for, for him to be able to do. And I think that it's on that sort of basis that you get into a better school. It's not just your grades. It's not just your test scores. Like, those are important. And that's not something you should neglect. But that's also something that you work on by doing well in your regular classroom and doing your normal responsibilities. And I think that what they're also looking for is having some other life experience. You've got to have some activity. You've got to have some kind of thing that that is yours that you do. Um, like I came out of college and I had, you know, pretty darn good grades. I was, I think, summa cum laude, magna cum laude. I was, I was on the cusp at least. I think I made summa cum laude right at the last second. Um, so like I was doing really well in school, but what's way more important to me than those grades I got in college, because like nobody's looking at my college transcript anymore. Nobody cares about that. Um, what was really important to me was my tournament organizing experience that I got from running Super Smash Brothers tournaments. Because I was able to grow that thing from being 5 to 10 people a week to being 150 people a week. And that was a legitimate undertaking that taught me a lot about how to build a community, that taught me how to talk to people, that ta taught me how to get people into a game, that taught me how to teach people because I was helping people learn the game. That experience was, it, it sounds ridiculous, that was more important professional experience in a number of lines of work that I got into than many of the classes that I took. And the same is going to be true in high school. Like, if you have something that you already know is your thing, like, if you know already that you want your whole life to be about making music, then, like, I had a, a, a friend in school who made three of her classes music classes who kind of fought tooth and nail with her guidance counselors so that she would be able to take as much music as she possibly could. She would use all of her free periods to be in the practice rooms. She'd spend her lunch in the practice rooms, even though they weren't supposed to eat there. And she would occasionally even just skip classes to go there. Um, I'm not recommending skipping classes, because that'll get you in some trouble. And there are some things that you should probably be learning besides that one thing. Like, it is important to be a little bit better rounded, because, like, for example, you need to know math to know the business skills, to know the statistics that you need to operate in the modern world. And if you're skipping math class, that, that can hurt you in some ways later on. But make your schedule, make your life as much about that thing as you can and try to like use school to accomplish that goal rather than making school itself the goal. Um, that's really important. But if you have ADHD and your major interest changes every few years, the thing, and this is something that happens to a lot of people and not just people with ADHD. Um, a lot of people will do something for two years and then get tired of it and move on to the next thing. I know a lot of very smart people who have been able to live that way. And one thing that's kind of nice for you is that that's the way the economy is built right now. Um, it's not necessarily a great thing for workers at the moment that it's hard to find stable work, but like we live in what we call a gig economy right now, which means more than you having the same job for 45 years and then retiring with a really big pension, you're going to be working a whole bunch of different places over time. Like the average amount of time that someone spends in a job right now is only three years. So you can kind of just do that and the economy is built to support that sort of a lifestyle. Um, but one thing that I've also found, because I have changed jobs before. I, you know, I started off as a teacher in one school. I moved to a different school with a different grade level. And then after teaching there, I became a tournament organizer and uh, kind of a shoutcaster and coach. I worked for Bravis after that. I got full time at Bravis. And so then I was working on that. And now I'm here working on this YouTube channel full time. I've done all of those different things. And what I found is that I could always use the skills that I developed in those different jobs in the next job and in the job after that. Like, building experience from doing something was never something that stopped me from moving on to the next thing. 
it just made me more qualified for the next thing. So, um, obviously, you know, if you're getting into really heavy science fields, there are definitely some barriers to entry there that you're going to have to push through, you know. Uh, hard sciences, engineering, really difficult STEM fields, they have really, really rigorous training that's required to get the skills that you need to do a good job there. And if you're trying to go from, you know, one of those to another one of those that's different from that, that's going to be really tough. That's probably going to take some extra years in school if you're going to try and make those kinds of jumps. So it's not possible in every environment, but something like teaching, teaching is valuable literally everywhere. There's, there's no job that you can do unless you're completely isolated from other people, um, which is very few jobs where a teaching, uh, some teaching experience is not going to be valuable to you. Just think of ways that you can combine your skills. Um, don't don't learn to get grades. Learn to get skills. Um, learn to develop your ability to do different things. Your ability to be functional in environments that other people wouldn't be. Because um, like, if you decide to, you know, you go off on a one year kick and learn graphic design. Well, now when you get some other random job and they're like, okay, we need to design a logo, you can just be like, hey, pay me overtime. I'll do that for you. That makes you more valuable to that company, even if that's, you know, something that you aren't as interested in, in anymore. If that's not something you want to become your job, that's just something you can offer and you can put that on a resume. And that's something that, you know, that combination of having this one skill and having this other skill makes you more attractive than someone who only has the one skill that they went to school for. I wanted to travel and find motivation for my future before I went to school because of COVID. I've been in college for computer programming, unsure if it's what I really want to do. So I still plan on traveling after I graduate to find out what I really like. Hmm. Um, one of the nice things about computer programming is that it does make a lot of money and money is something that gives you a buffer to be able to transition to other things. Um, so even if you work that job for like two years, you're going to be living in a nice enough place and have a big enough budget that you probably have a little bit of a cushion to be able to go and do something else. Um, so that is an option. And there is something to be said for just doing a job because it's a job and it gets you money. Uh, but if it's not something that you like, if it's making you less happy to be doing it, don't be afraid to just cut the cord and, and quit and go someplace else. Like, especially early on in your life when you don't have commitments to, to family, um, a family of your own in particular. Um, if you have at least a little bit of money as a cushion, like, you can really go and explore a lot more. I, I, one of my friends just up and moved to Alaska after he graduated from college because he was going through, you know, some tough times personally and he didn't like where he was at. So he was just like, you know what? Screw it. I, I found a job in Alaska. I'm going to Alaska. And he did it. He uprooted his entire life. He, he had nobody who lived there. And he went to this like very out of the way island where there were only 800 people living. And he loved it. Uh, he developed really great pers personal skills, interpersonal skills there. Um, he got way better at his job. He was able to transition that into other things like... It was great for him. So don't feel like you're stuck if you do have the physical, like, material means to go somewhere and do something else. Don't feel scared just because it's a change. Like, change like that can actually be adapted to pretty well. We're, we're pretty adaptable organisms as people. Champ, start a podcast. I did try that once. I did try that once. It was called Taking Stock. It was with uh, Mikey, the cheat. And, uh... We didn't get very many views, but I really enjoyed those conversations and they helped me solidify a lot of my philosophy on this subject. Problem is you're commu consuming tomato soup. Yes, yes. Um, that video did not do well, by the way. <laughs> that video was, uh, I think, the, the, the worst out of the last 10 by, by the metrics that I've released. Um, let's take a look here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is ranked 10 out of 10 for the the first 12 hours of any video i've made in the last 10 uploads so uh i'm not expecting to to start to turn this into a culinary channel anytime soon in case anyone was worried <laughs> stop with the tomato soup slander oh okay so it was just my my bad opinion on tomato soup huh that that was that was why it didn't do well right okay real ones loved the soup video <laughs> there, it was funny like <clears throat> There were all the pos the comments are really positive. I don't have anybody in there complaining about the fact that I made a soup tier list. 
It's just the people who didn't want to see a soup tier list didn't click on it. That's that's the measure of success there, really. Um, and that's one of those tricky things about managing communities. Like, you get a lot of people who are diehard fans of something. Um, and I, I noticed this in the, the Smash community first. You get a lot of people who are like the diehard fans who show up every single week, you know, who they that's their main social circle. That's all the friends they hang out with. And then you get some other people who are more peripheral, who like, they may have a friend or two who competes in it, but their main circle of friends is someplace else. They're not as invested in the scene. They're not as, you know, strong of a player, that kind of thing. And there are way more of those players, way more of the less invested players than there are of the really invested ones. But the really invested ones, because they're always there and because they're so outspoken and they feel comfortable there, that's, that's their place. They feel like they have an outsized voice on what happens there. And it's really easy as a leader to get too caught up in what that two to 3% of people are saying, because that's 40% of what you're hearing is what those two to 3% are saying. Um, and it becomes hard to kind of make decisions as, as a community, because if you just listen to what's said the most loudly, a lot of the people who don't feel like they have as much of a say in the community won't speak up, even though that's not what they really want, and they're the majority. And so this silent, min this loud minority, this silent majority system starts to make it so that you make decisions that aren't really what's in the best interest of the community. Um, and I feel like we're kind of seeing a little bit of that on the soup tier list. <laughs> that, like, I've got a lot of fans who like me for me, and not just for teaching them Splatoon or dating advice. And those people are, like, really happy to, to meme on me with the, the soup tier list and stuff, and they're having a good time. But a lot of the major audience that I've developed is not interested in seeing what my opinion is on Progresso brand soups. And so they're not going to go and sit around and watch that. So uh, that's, it was an interesting experiment to see if, you know, that's something that people would like to watch. But um, I, I think I'm going to stray a little bit further away from that sort of content. I'm going to spread the soup tier list everywhere. I am the loud minority. Sorry, I wanted soup. <laughs> I loved it. It was fun. Yeah. And see, that's also a lot of the people who are just going to hang around after after dark, after hours. You know, you guys are the, you guys are the, the kids in the class who ate lunch in the teacher's classroom because they wanted to hang out with that teacher. Like, that, that's you guys, okay? There are, like, maybe, like, five of those in a class of 180 uh, a lot of the time. And, uh, you know, those kids are great, and you get an opportunity to have an impact on them and to really be a role model for them. Um, but also, it's not all of the kids, and you cannot expect everyone in the class to respond the way that those kids do. Calling me out for socializing with the teachers? It's not a bad thing. It's probably better than, than socializing with, with some of the kids you could be hanging out with, but... Um, definitely good to have, like, a social circle outside of the teacher. Like, you don't want to just be friends with the teacher if, if you can get away with it. Um, if all of the, if, I guess if all of the kids are bigots and, and you're someone that they're going to discriminate against, then you're, you're kind of stuck there, you know? But, um, most of the time there, there's, there's someone to make friends with and it's definitely worth doing that. So don't, don't miss out on opportunities to be, be friends with your peers because adults are going to get old fashioned and behind on the times at some point. It, it, it starts to happen towards the end of, of high school, roughly. Like, kids really start to become good judges of their teachers. They start to be able to recognize small weaknesses in their teacher's ideologies or places where they're wrong. And uh, if your, your teachers are your only circle of friends, you're going to start falling behind the other kids at that point. Um, you got to make sure that you are in touch with both your peers and your elders and not just one or the other. Haven't seen the soup video yet, but I love when channels post a bizarre, weird, and unrelated video. <laughs> yeah, it, it was just a tier list of the soups that I eat on stream. And now that I think about it, I'm getting really hungry. Uh, I'm going to go put some water on the boil and then come back and, and chat some more. Just had mushroom soup before coming here. Ah, they're, 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 my recommendation, of course. Yes, see, I am, I'm improving people's lives both in, 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 in by giving them advice about uh, high school and also in uh, improving their, their choice of soups. Yes, something like that. Vote one for Progresso Minestrone. I've never actually tried the Minestrone. I have no idea uh, how good that is. I don't even, I don't think I know what Minestrone is. I'm going to go Google that real quick. Minestrone soup. Uh, a thick soup of Italian origin made with vegetables, often with the addition of pasta or rice, sometimes both. Okay, so it's like a vegetarian noodle soup. I guess the, the question there depends on whether you're you're a vegetarian or not. Um, if, you need, if you need the protein and you're cool with eating meat on moral grounds, then definitely you'd probably want to go for the beef and vegetable, I think. Um, 
but might be a better variety of vegetables or, you know, I'd have to take a look at what the actual ingredients are and how good they taste and stuff to be able to make a judgment. Give us diet advice. Uh, don't go on diets. Just fix what you normally eat. <laughs> going on diets never works. The problem with diets is that the diet is going to end at some point. You can't make a diet temporary. You have to change what you're actually eating uh, if you want the new normal to be different than what it is. You're going to have to change something. And that's the, the part that's really hard for people. Um, a lot of a lot of diets, a lot of like fad diets are just straight up dangerous and should not be done by humans. They are not safe. If it's not something that you're going to permanently maintain, it's not worth it. Now, the, you can get away with a lot more food if you work out pretty heavily. Like I was a distance runner, which meant that I could just eat like three plates of pasta and that was actually healthy for me, if anything. Um, that was... That was called carbo loading. That was a way that you could uh, boost your performance on a future race. Uh, if I'm not working out that much, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> it's probably going to make me feel sick. I had a, a bunch of uh, gym teachers whose line was, uh, I work out so I can eat. And I think there is really some truth to that. Just getting your metabolism up has a lot of health benefits and lets you just, just kind of eat whatever you want sometimes. That's why I'm still skinny. Like, I haven't been that much of an active runner for a while, but I, I just sit at my computer and I'm still skinny because I'm coasting off of uh, the metabolism I built up when I could run a marathon back in the day. Running can be very meditative and it will give you an extra minute of run speed. You can devise carbon roller strategies. There is something to be said for having some athletic abilities, I guess. Uh, in a competitive setting like it lets you any physical process that's like demands effort which does include focusing your attention on something that is a physical thing that your body needs resources to do um, you know your brain is a lot of the the body heat that you generate because it takes resources to run this thing um, that takes you know a certain amount of physical stability strength to be able to keep up um so having good cardio having good core strength posture I, I don't like recommending things about posture because a lot of stuff people say about posture is nonsense but um with uh having being in good shape basically it can make it so that it's easier for you to focus um a lot of even you know top players swear by having like a little bit of an athletic regimen, just doing a little bit of running or something, a little bit of weight training, um, and that, that helps them stay focused in positions where they otherwise wouldn't. Um, it's something that it's, uh, in bigger esports, when they have a team, they'll have like a team chef. They'll have a, a team gym. Like people will be, you know, given workout regimens by their coaches so that they're in physical shape as well as in shape to play the game. So that's, that's not something to completely scoff at.